This is Bill Farmer again. Welcome back to McMaster University course Computer Science and Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics and Applications 2. We're going to have our last lecture on the topic of Turing machines and computability. And we're going to finish up with the part on undecidable decision problems. Now, last time, we had looked at a proof by Georg Cantor that showed that there are uncountable sets. Uh, this proof is important to us because he used a method of diagonalization. And we're going to use the same method to show that there is a particular problem, a particular decision problem that is undecidable. Now, a bit back, we had this question about modern computers what is the distinguishing characteristic of a modern computer? And our answer is that modern computers can store and run programs. And if you think of a Turing machine as being as powerful as a computer, in some ways more powerful because it has infinite amount of memory, we should be able to store and run programs. Um, so this brings us to the notion of a universal Turing machine. So what is a universal Turing machine? Well, we have to start off with, we need, we're going to need a way of encoding Turing machines as strings over zeros and ones. And if, we, if you go to Cozen's book, he, he describes how to do it, but there's a lot of ways this could be done. You could work out your own scheme. Um, the scheme works because we have only a finite number of states, a finite input alphabet, finite tape alphabet, finite number of possible transitions, and so forth. So we need a way of encoding up the whole description of a Turing machine as a string of zeros and ones. So we're going to assume we have a way of doing this. Uh, like I said, there's many ways of doing it. So if we take a Turing machine we will have a representation of it as a string. And not only that, if we take an, an input string for my Turing machine, we will have a string that represents it. And now what we can do is construct a Turing machine, u, and u takes strings of the form, it takes strings of the form like this. And if the first part is a code for a Turing machine, and the second part is a code for input for it, and u accepts that string, it will do it when m accepts x. And it will reject that string when m rejects x. And it will loop on that string when m loops on x. So m, so uh, u simulates exactly what m would do. So if u is, is running on this string, it will, it will simulate exactly what m will do on x. And if we give it a string, yz, where z does not, is not a valid encoding of a string, or z is not a valid encoding of a string, then it will reject. So this is what u does. And we can construct such a Turing machine U. And so this Turing machine can simulate any other Turing machine. So in a real sense, we don't need all those other Turing machines. We can just use this Turing machine and we can simulate any Turing machine with it. So this is called a universal Turing machine. And the language it accepts is going to be the language of strings of this form such that X is a member of the language accepted by M. Okay, um, so now let's talk a bit about a very important problem, the halting problem. So this is a problem of deciding whether a given Turing machine, M, halts on a given input X. Uh, now we know this problem is semi we know it's 
semi-decidable. This is easy to show because if we take our universal Turing machine and we give it a code for M and we give it a code for an input for M and then we run that that machine if the machine halts then we know that M halts in X. Now the problem is if the machine doesn't halt we don't know if it halts. If it doesn't halt after a billion steps it may halt after a trillion steps but we don't know. So that's why it's semi-decidable. It will answer the question yes if the machine if M halts in X but it won't necessarily answer the machine otherwise. So the halting problem we can see is semi-decidable. We know this by, the, by using a Turing machine. But it turns out not only is it semi-decidable, it is undecidable. And this is what Turing showed in 1937, and his proof is by diagonalization. So we're going to give the proof uh, right now. Okay, so let's say we take any string of zeros and ones, any finite strings of zeros and ones. Now, remember we have this scheme for encoding Turing machines. Uh, this string may be an encoding of a Turing machine. Uh, if it is, then we will say mx is that Turing machine. So if x encodes a Turing machine, mx is that machine. If it's not an encoding for a Turing machine, then we'll say mx is some trivial Turing machine that immediately halts in all strings. So you give it any string, it just halts immediately. Okay, so now let's consider the following infinite two-dimensional matrix. Over here, we have all possible Turing machines, and these Turing machines are given by, are identified by strings of zeros and ones. Some of these are the trivial Turing machine that just immediately halts. Other ones are Turing machines that do something useful. And, and these are the possible inputs to the Turing machine. So these, these are, remember, we're, we're focusing on Turing machines that take inputs, which are strings of zero and so on. So, so these are the possible inputs. And then H here means it halts. So like if we look at this one and this one, this says, uh, well, H means it halts, L means it loops. So this says that this machine, this Turing machine, given this input, loops. So we have this big infinite dimensional matrix. Uh, we have all the machines here, all the possible inputs here. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to assume that we have a machine K, it's total, and so it's a Turing machine. We're assuming that we have such a machine, it's total, and K accepts X sharp Y if the X Turing machine halts on Y. And it rejects X sharp Y if the X machine loops on Y. This is what it does. So remember, halts, there's two possibilities, accepts and rejects. So, so this is, we're assuming we have this machine. And so we can describe the, the behavior using, again, this, this big thing. So for X, we have possible strings. Y, we have possible strings. If we look, if we have this as a string and this as a string, the A tells us K halts. And what that means is, it means that M01 on 10, um, I should say, it means this um, accepts. What that means is M01 on 10 halts. And for instance, down here we have a reject. That means that M10 on 10 here loops. So this halts, this loops. Okay, so that's what K does. 
And the important thing to note is that K solves the halting problems for Turing machines whose input alphabet is 0, 1. So it doesn't solve the halting machine for all Turing machines. It just halts, solves it for, for Turing machines with input alphabets consisting of 0 and 1. OK, so what we want to show is that there can't be such a K. If, if, there, if we can show there can't be such a K, then we can't solve the halting problem. We can't even solve it for this restricted class of Turing machines. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Turing machine, D, D for diagonalization. I'm going to use a diagonalization argument. I'm going to create a Turing machine. And this Turing machine uh, takes an input, x, which is a string of zeros and ones, and it runs k. Remember, we have this thing I just described. We have this nice total Turing machine up here. We're going to run k on x sharp x. If you give it an x, we run k on x sharp x. Now, k will either accept or reject. Uh, our machine will accept if k rejects. And it will loop if, if k accepts. So this is pretty easy. If we have a, if we have a, a Turing machine k, it's very easy to create this diagonalization machine. We, we basically uh, can run k because we can simulate k just the way we would with a universal Turing machine. So we can create this Turing machine. And um, notice that the Turing machine is defined by the diag diagonal of k's matrix. Because uh, what it does is, is if we were, when we're running k on this, this diagonal point, xx, if k rejects, d accepts. And if k loops, uh, I should say, if k accepts, d loops. So if we go up here and we look at the diagonal, if it, if it rejects, we're going to loop. If it accepts, um, as a, if it accepts, no, excuse me, if it rejects, we're going to accept. If it accepts, we're going to loop. So we change, we're going to basically change those. OK, so we have this D. Now, D is a Turing machine. And we know from the Church Turing thesis that um, it's like any other Turing machine, so it's going to have a code. And so D equals MX for some X. So there's going to be a code that goes with D. OK, so now let's say we take D and we, uh, we say that D halts an X. So this may be true or not. But if, if D halts an X, that's the same as saying that K rejects X sharp X. That's the way D was defined. So D halts an X is the same as saying K rejects an X sharp X. But K, um, what does K do? K rejects this precisely if, if the Turing machine for X loops an X. So this means MX loops on X. Now MX is the same as D. So this is the same as saying D loops an X. So what we see here is that D halts an X precisely if D loops an X. Well, this is a contradiction. There's no way a machine can both halt and loop at the same time. So this means there is no possible Turing machine K. And as a result, it is not possible to solve the, uh, as I said here, it's not possible to solve the halting problem for Turing machines whose alphabet is 0, 1, let alone solving the halting problem for all Turing machines. OK, so this is, this is one of the great theorems of theoretical computer science, one of the great theorems of computability theory, because it gives a precise example of a decision problem that is undecidable. OK, now let's talk about something else. 
Uh, let's say we had two alphabets, sigma and pi. And we have a set of strings of sigma and a set, I should say, a string B A, or set of strings A, which are strings formed from the alphabet sigma, and a, similarly a set of strings B over the alphabet pi. And we can say that we have a reduction, which is more precisely a many-one reduction of A to B, if there's a com total computable function, some total computable function, that maps the strings of sigma to the strings of pi, such that whenever x is a member of A, that will be the case, that will be, the tr that will be true if and only if the mapping of x um, the mapping of x is a member of b. So, so uh, another way of saying it, we can, we can test whether x is a member of a by testing whether sigma x is a member of b, and vice versa. So this is, so we say a is reducible, which we write like this, if there is a reduction of a to b. And what this gives, if you take a little time to think about it, it basically gives us the following theorem. If, if A reduces to B, then B is RE implies that A is RE. And similarly, if B is recursive, implies if A is recursive. Because basically, uh, the idea is if we have this reduction and we know how to enumerate B, we can enumerate A by taking members of sigma star mapping them to members of pi star and then seeing if they um, come up in the enumeration of B. And they're going to come up in the enumeration of B only if they were members of A. Okay, so, so I won't go through the proof of the second one, but it's similar. Um, so, so this is very useful because this means this gives us another way of showing that there are undecidable decision problems. So there's many, many undecidable decision problems. And there's two basic techniques. Diagonalization, which we saw that we proved the uh, halting problem is undecidable, and reduction. And the way reduction works is if you look at these theorems, with reduction we want to show that something's undecidable. What we want to do is take Let's say in this case, we want to take the contrapositive, which will be equivalent. So we want to say if A is not recursive, that implies B is not recursive. So let's say we were trying to show that B is not recursive. What do we do? We come up with a decision problem that is not recursive, and we reduce it to B. So this gives us another technique to show that, that decision problems are undecidable. So diagonalization gets us going, but reduction allows us to show that there are many, many undecidable decision problems by reducing undecidable decision problems to new problems and thereby showing that those new problems are also undecidable. Okay, so um, we have one more thing which it looks like I uh, I didn't have an end slide so I can't quite show this um, but the last slide which you'll see in the slides it shows a table that you've seen before of languages, grammars, and automata. And we have regular, context-free, uh, deterministic context-free, linear, uh, context-sensitive, RE, and recursive. So take a look at the slides and you can see that. So this ends our lectures for this course. I hope you enjoyed them. Uh, and that's all. Hopefully, I will run into you later. Goodbye.